Um, I will let you do a little bit of bio because I don't have that um, ahead of time. So I'll just do the quick housekeeping and then mm -hmm. you can just give a little bit of background to folks on who you are. Okay. Okay. So hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for attending the webinar today. Um, my name is Michelle Gray, and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part to thanks to contributions from the Government of Canada. And today we are delighted to have um, to be hosting Vince McMullen, who's going to be talking about data and data management, and um, and then also showing at the end um, some. Uh, long awaited or some people have been waiting for the, the, the new aquatic data warehouse for New Brunswick, the, the MB Waters. Uh, a few quick housekeeping matters before we start. For those of you that are new to this series, we save all questions until the end of the presentation. Um, to ask your question, you can use uh, in your webinar control panel, the little gray box. Um, if it's minimized, you can hit the orange arrow to enlarge it, but you should be able to see a little ha a virtual hand. Um, a little orange hand or yellow hand um, and raise that and we can unmute you if you have a mic to ask the question or if you prefer you can type your question on the control panel and um, Darla or I can read it aloud during this at the end of the session. Um, without further ado, I will turn the webinar over to Vince. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. So you guys can see my, see my screen I think? No, we're seeing your workstation. I think you're on the other monitor. Oh, okay. Let me just... Uh, <laughs> one second. I have to apologize. We uh, just got the internet fast here. It's actually really windy right now here in St. John. I don't know if anybody here is from St. John, but uh, we lost the internet here on the west side for most of the morning. <laughs> Great timing. Yeah. I still no. see your. I see your uh, workstation window. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's just see here. It was up a few minutes, like a minute ago. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, let's just go ahead and try this then. Okay, can you guys see it? Now we do, yep. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, Terrific. Can you see the talk? Okay. Fantastic. All right. Um, well, so today I'm going to be giving a presentation. Uh, Vince, you've cut out. We're not hearing you any longer. Well, that was fairly annoying. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be giving a presentation, um, one that I've done for the Canadian Water Network um, about a year ago. It's called Water in the Clouds. And uh, this is sort of playing on a bit of a pun um, with regards to water data and putting water data into... Um, what we traditionally know as web servers and databasing. So just to give a quick overview of the talk, um, I'll give a personal statement. I'll talk a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some existing cloud technologies. I'm also going to get into talking about some watershed monitoring and uh, talking about the cloud. Then I'm going to work into talking about cloud requirements, some lessons learned from my previous work, as well as some next steps and considerations. So in terms of a personal statement, I, I believe that we need to look at all of our data, in other words, the big picture, in order to truly understand the impacts of our collective decisions on one non-renewable resource that we simply can't live without. And that, of course, is water. In terms of my background, I've spent uh, well over the past decade um, looking at issues with regards to um, taking 
water-based data, uh, whether it be ecosystem-based health data, uh, hydrographic data, um, water quality data, and putting those types of data into very large cumulative data sets that can be used for things like cumulative effects assessment. Um, I've worked with a number of universities on this topic, from undergraduate all the way up to currently to my PhD. Um, I've worked with research councils as well as the United Nations, um, Environment Canada, international governments such as the Singaporean government. Um, I've also worked with a number of institutes, uh, including the Canadian Rivers Institute, the Canadian Water Network, um, which is sort of a theme with me. Um, I've spent a number of years working with the Canadian Water Network on this particular topic, as well as uh, the Bordeaux Lakes Institute in uh, Cape Breton. So my current work right now for my PhD uh, contributes to this sort of ongoing effort with me uh, personally, developing a cumulative effects assessment based framework for the St. John Harbor. With that project, one of the things uh, that I've identified as being very important is also having a very strong database management system that can be used to collect data when myself and my colleagues are finished with our work on the St. John Harbor and we decide to go on and do other things. Um, what we're hoping to build is a uh, monitoring uh, uh, framework that can be used for many generations to come. So with that, I, I'd like to ask if anybody here on this call knows who the Canadian Water Network is and, and do they know what the Canadian Water Network does because this will sort of uh, continue to be a theme throughout my talk, so I'm curious if anybody here, I don't know how that will work, Michelle, but... Uh, uh, so Vince, I don't think there's an easy way that we can unmute everyone. Um, okay. So perhaps maybe we can just um, assume that some folks do and some folks don't. Okay. Okay. Okay, so just moving along then. Um, I have a decent history with the Canadian Water Network. Like I said, um, I've worked uh, my master's degree was funded through CWN. My PhD, uh, currently, there's some funding coming through the CWN. And uh, I've spent uh, a great deal of time working on data management issues with the Canadian Water Network on a project uh, that was funded through CWN known as Threats. And Threats was the Healthy River Ecosystem Assessment System. And uh, it was a project of the University of Saskatchewan. And this particular project uh, basically was, they were trying to bring together very large data sets from across Canada, um, including things like water quality, municipal waste, um, and a number of other large data sets to do cumulative effects assessment. And um, unfortunately, that project is currently right now on, on hold. Um, and I'm no longer working on that project, but uh, I'm hoping that that does come back, um, become accessible um, to everybody in Canada. Um, so this is a quick story that I've told to students before. One of the things that um, I've observed over the last few years is students have started to figure out, graduate students, undergraduate students, have started to figure out there are technologies out there to assist them in their um, um, everyday uh, uh, data mining, data collecting activities. And one of those tools is uh, Dropbox. And so Dropbox is a tool that I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. It's a cloud-based file system that can be used to store data. And students have started using this to store data. And I've noticed that lots of professionals now have started using Dropbox as well. Um, however, Dropbox to me is a very limited piece of software, but it does provide the, the idealistic uh, atmosphere that I want to promote, and that is storing water data in the cloud so it can be accessible for many generations and, and not be hidden somewhere on a, on a floppy drive in uh, somebody's file cabinet. So for the Canadian Water Network, um, I've pitched to them that they should have an official Dropbox that they set up themselves internally, a commercial-based application that they can use to collect all of their data and keep track of it. And they're actually working on that initiative now, which is really great, and they're encouraging all the watershed nodes across Canada to also look at this, uh, this technology and, and use it for at least collecting things like spreadsheets and access databases. 
Um, why do we use a tool like Dropbox? Well, it's easy to use, installs on all computers, it's accessible, um, it's fairly secure in terms of data. Um, the safety of the data is, of course, a concern. If somebody sits down at your computer, they do have access to the data on that workstation. Um, and also data synchronizes, and this is something that a lot of professionals don't seem to realize is that Dropbox actually keeps many different revisions of the data. Every time you save a new version of the file and it gets uploaded to Dropbox, all the old revisions are actually there and you can go back and restore it. So for example, if um, you have your, uh, you know, uh, an incident and you happen to lose your data, your hard drive goes corrupt or whatever, that data is actually available and you can go and get an older copy if you need to. It also makes it fairly easy to share data um, to colleagues across a network, especially in a remote environment um, such as the Canadian Water Network. Um, you know, there's individuals working for that network across Canada, and so this is a tool that makes sense for them. Um, what Dropbox doesn't do for us is it's just a file service. So there's no way to query similar data sets. There's no way to generate reports from the service. Um, it really more so encourages teams to work in isolation and actually fuels that, uh, uh, that idea. And there's no administrative control. And uh, that's something that uh, administrators and, and managers are looking for, to be able to have some upper level, upper security tiered control over the data. So another example of a cloud-based service is, of course, these two uh, uh, icons in the tech industry, Facebook and Twitter. I'm sure everybody here on the, on the channel has heard of uh, Facebook and Twitter by now. Um, if you haven't, you've definitely been under a rock. <laughs> With Facebook, they've been developing some technologies recently, such as uh, this Facegraph search tool. And this is something that was announced uh, late last year. And so with Facegraph, um, similar, similar interests of people are being able, people are able to share those across um, a network. So you have a network of people and they have a similar interest. The idea behind Facebook is that you can come along and you can type somebody's name and an interest or just an interest and find somebody in your network that has the same interests. How this is working in the back end is very similar to how we envision developing environment tools um, for people to do things like monitoring. If you have a, for example, a data set that may contain some variable that you're interested in for your environment, such as a water quality parameter like cadmium, and let's say you're interested in looking at cadmium across many different uh, rivers in Canada, you can type in cadmium and then you can get all the results from all of the rivers that may contain cadmium and present it in a, a readable sort of reporting type fashion that you can kind of dig into and get the data and do analytics with. And that's how we're envisioning um, NB Waters. Um, another ex interesting example of these cloud-based technologies is, of course, how Twitter is used um, by the CDC now. So the CDC, um, as uh, you may be familiar with who CDC is, uh, are keeping track of um, various ailments um, that come up in the population every year, such as flus, coughs, fevers. Um, and so they keep track of uh, all of the people now that uh, report into the hospital and help the, uh, the professionals that they're sick. And they compare it to the data that they have on Twitter, which you know, basically people are tweeting out there in the world that they have the flu or they have a cold. And the CDC now is mining all of this data. And what they're finding is, is 30, sometimes 40 percent more of the population are actually sick than the, uh, the hospital administrators have been reporting in the past to CDC. Because most people that get a cold or a flu actually don't go to the hospital. And this is actually re really starting to become very interesting um, for the medical professionals, not just in the U.S., but of course Canada and the rest of the world. Because using social networks to track the spread of disease is, is a very important endeavor. This type of technology can be, again, once again, used um, for the collecting environment, environment, environment data. Um, for example, if we want to look at the, the health of a, of a fish, such as uh, uh, you know, a bent Achille fish, for instance, um, many, many, many scientific uh, reports have been published on the health of the bent Achille fish. If we had something like this that was being used in conjunction with uh, data that's being collected on that fish by consulting companies, academics, um, industry, 
we would be able to have a better idea if the spread of, spread of disease and, and, and illness amongst uh, that fish population is something that we should be concerned about. Um, another tools, of course, Gmail. Uh, I'm sure everybody saw those marketing ads that pop up on Gmail now. They're very specifically tailored towards, um, towards you as the user. Uh, they're very, very specific. Um, something you may have searched for on Google, you know, next thing you know you have a company presenting to you a solution in your Gmail, in the Gmail ad. Um, those types of things uh, are all being done in the back end by cloud servers and very large marketing data sets are being built not only by Google and Gmail but also many, many, many other companies, um, big, big companies such as Walmart, Costco, uh, even banks now are keeping track of what people are doing in their organizations, what their consumers are buying, and they're using that information to be able to present more goods and more marketing um, to the general public. And, and to me, this, is, this endeavor, once again, uh, you know, makes me ask, why, why are we so far behind in terms of uh, our data being collected in the environment? And, and why don't we have these types of uh, you know, organizations for our sector? Um, I continue to keep pressing upon, you know, folks uh, both in government and industry that this is something that really needs to be considered in the future. Every day, many of us, we, co we uh, make, uh, you know, an unwilling, unwillingly and unknowing, uh, uh, we participate in the, the data collection that's been, been uh, happening across the world by many, many different organizations. Um, I think if we asked many of the folks uh, on this call, they were you know, if they were aware of how many organizations collected data on them today, um, they probably would know about 25% they'd be able to, you know, identify. So, um, how is it all possible? Well, it's all possible by cloud power. And so this is a buzzword that the tech industry came up with uh, several years ago to really describe what a, what a server mainframe is. And so a server mainframe sits out there in the, in the somewhere in a, in a data center, and the server mainframe presents data and collects data from many different devices, um, and those devices are all part of what we know as the cloud. This technology, now this is a, uh, an image that was taken um, inside of one of Google's data centers. Each one of, uh, each one of those racks represents a server. Um, each each rack consists of about uh, 20 servers. And so in this room alone, uh, there's more than 10,000 servers. And so each one of these servers is a member of this Google Cloud. And this cloud happens, just, just so happens to be what we know as the Gmail Cloud. So during my undergraduate, I, um, I had the idea that we should start building geo databases and collecting data on the environment. So one of all of the data that we collected in this estuary could be then put somewhere in a data center like this. And then we would have the ability to be able to take that data and be able to analyze it and look for hotspots, environmental issues within a particular watershed. This particular watershed is a watershed in, Ath in the, the Athabasca. This Athabasca watershed is something that uh, we've been looking at for um, a, number, a number of years in Saskatchewan. And one of the things that strikes me about this particular uh, watershed is that there's been a lot of data collected because it's in, in an area where we know, that, um, we know that the oil sands industry exists in this area and there's many industries that have been collecting data on this watershed. And basically what we've been trying to do in, in this and, and uh, other watersheds within the, within the oil sands is we've been trying to determine where hot spots and, and hot moments exist. And so a hot spot is, is basically you know, a spatial difference between sites um, that we may see an elevated uh, uh, pollutant in the water, for instance, that's causing some degradation in the environment, um, and, a, and a hot you know, and a hot spot is something that right now we, uh, you know, we still kind of struggle to figure out how we can take those data and, and put them into a data management system that all of the industries within the oil sands can have uh, easily be easily accessible 
and also uh, the provincial governments, for instance, to be able to access that information and the federal government to be able to access that information. And that's something that we continue to this day to, uh, to struggle with and determine how to um, address these issues. So what is normal in, in time and space? Well, that's something that we are, we're looking to these large data sets to determine. So is there seasonal and annual differences? Uh, is there spatial differences between rivers, basins, watersheds? What, you know, the question is, what is not normal? You know, what's an exceedance? Um, new data sets with exceedances, what does that look like? Uh, based on seasons, uh, you know, within a watershed, um, how do we link these differences to stress? And do, are these stressors real, or is it something that's just within the natural variability? These types of questions are more easily answered if we have d um, a large volume of data because within that large volume of data, we can look within the data and see, and see a trend faster. So we know that, you know, for instance, I've got this particular data here circled. Um, the cloud allows researchers and organizations that are concerned about the environment to examine these larger coordinated data sets more efficiently, and we can detect a problem within the watershed or within the river, within the population faster because we have these large data sets that are accessible and, and more easily uh, analyzed by researchers. Some of the past mistakes that I've observed, um, there's been no data standardization um, for many of the projects, bo both at the municipal, provincial, and the federal level. Um, data is often stored in its original formats uh, custom processes are built to translate these individual data sets, which makes things fairly difficult um, to add new data, uh, to fix problems or gaps that are in the current data. Um, oftentimes, there's many thousands of duplicated units used. This makes it very difficult uh, in terms of database uh, uh, analyst analytics. There's no security or there's too much security on these data. Uh, poor storage formats is something I mentioned already, like Microsoft Access, Excel, even text files I've seen used. Poor geospatial layers, so the spatial layers are tied to uh, on-site databases, which makes it very difficult to use in a remote environment um, or give to another organization to utilize. Expensive, <coughs> expensive software is often required. So one of the things I've often, often seen is is that uh, you know government and, and uh, medium-sized to big industry often uh, use the most expensive geospatial software, and they often store all of their data in these uh, these formats, which makes it inaccessible to folks with such as nonprofit groups, um, students even. Uh, you know, and these types of challenges are something that, you know, we need to continue to keep overcoming um, if we want to take data and make it available in an open, standardized format. Of course, other challenges such as inadequate funding, um, the inability to be able to host the data online, um, inadequate personnel, um, find, you know, finding personnel um, with the skills to be able to take data from a organization and put that data on a network um, into a database, provide, make it web accessible, provide you know, accessibility to other organizations is, uh, is a costly process for many. So I would like to propose that we develop a national guidance document um, for watersheds and, and, and that they can put their existing data into the cloud for future access. And this is something that I've been working on with the, the Canadian Water Network now for um, the last year. And basically, what we would like to see is, is, is this document provided to everybody. And so what we're, what we're looking to do is, is we're looking to put together a, a published open standard for collecting data, um, providing some tools and, and services, um, and making them freely available to organizations so they can collect and consume these data um, and, and take it and put it into the format that's required for us to be able to store it in the cloud. Data, data standardization is a, really, is a really important topic. This is a figure that I put together uh, back about two years ago now. 
And this figure describes two different projects that I that I'd worked on. Um, both of them were really, uh, really great projects, and both of them had a really, really great effort. And I was part of the engineering behind both of them. The first figure, so for project one, uh, the first figure, um, you can see the different clouds um, with uh, water written in different languages. And so those are non-standard data sets. What we do is we write a translation process. So we translate that particular language, and we put it into a language that we can understand and all of the other clouds can understand. And then we process that data and we produce results from that data. And so that's one model. And, and that model, um, that model had, had a lot of challenges. Because one of the things that we experienced um, with that was that basically um, it forced us to do a lot of the work up front. And when we were forced to do all of the work up front in terms of translating the, uh, the, the, the data, of course it required a great deal of time and effort and funding. And so what we realized was people really wanted to see the results faster. So in the second model, for project two, um, we have, the, again, the non-standardized data set, water in different languages, and we translated the data once again, but then we processed that particular translation and we produced the result. And so we could produce results faster um, with this model. And uh, this model, while it allows us to produce the results faster and produce results, uh, produce reports faster, um, we're unable to cumulatively take all of the different data sets and put them together and produce a result unless we use model one on top of that. And so these are sort of two types of models that uh, have been kicked around quite a bit um, in terms of translating data from an organization and putting it into, um, and that's when we are the ones doing the translation. So what I would like to do is I would like to have an open data standard that's followed by all of the organizations and agencies. And that open data standard can be shared amongst everybody. And as long as everybody is following the open data standard, um, we are then able to actually take as many data sets as we can um, that are similar in nature, collected similarly in nature, and put those data into at the same database, um, a very large cloud-based database, which would allow us to be able to run analytics against those data. And we don't have to be the ones always doing the translation because that's most of the projects in Canada that have tried that. Every one of them have burned out. Every one of them that I've been a part of have burned out. So, so security of the data is, of course, another important thing. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. So two months ago, I was in a closed-door meeting with a government official who made the statement that there's some data the public should know. Um, this was a very telling statement to me from, uh, from, a, from a government official. I, I was fairly concerned about that statement um, because the type of data, types of data that we were talking about at the time um, is data that uh, is collected for the, be the betterment of the public. And so this particular official felt that there were things in that, that data that could cause um, public alarm. And, um, so that we don't have that data to put into our Indy Waters platform, which is a very concerning thing for me. So my proposal that went to the CWN, I asked them to mandate that all of the data that's collected from their watershed nodes be considered open source. And so if you have a watershed node that's out there collecting data that's being funded publicly, that data should be required to be open source. And anybody should be able to access that data. Um, well, that was uh, a message that was met with very mixed emotions by folks. But at the same time, if this is an initiative that's not really considered something that's, that's important, um, we're going to start running into the same types of issues um, in terms of being able to access the data. And the data being made uh, publicly available um, certainly access to that problem. So by open sourcing data, we ensure that the data will be freely available for future generations. And by regulating all the data be open source, we likely enhance data understanding. 
And, and of course, by providing the open source cloud, we encourage other agencies to follow suit, um, both nationally and internationally. So I've recommended, um, as I said, we, I've recommended that the, the water network start small with this particular proposal. And so I suggested that they consider picking one watershed, the, the St. John watershed, as, as being the node to start with, and uh, basically bring the rest of the watersheds across Canada that are part of the Canadian water network um, into this model um, as we continue to grow it in St. John. A national uh, standard for data entry, I think, is important to most of us, and uh, it should be published and mandated. Adopting such a standard and staying with it ensures our success, um, even at the smallest scale. And um, developing guidance documentation um, for the collection of this data um, and providing the tools to allow the data to be entered into the cloud in a common format, I think is a really good initiative and something that um, most agencies are very, 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 very interested in. Um, developing these ease of use syncing applications um, such as NB Waters is something that I've been working on over the last couple of months. So developing a website application which provides the facility for anybody collecting environment-based data um, providing the tools to be able to access that data in a web format. Also collecting things such as pictures, um, comments, and, and notes from the general public about these watersheds um, is, is another very important endeavor, which is part of the NB Waters platform. And um, don't require any expensive licensing or software to be able to use the application is another um, very important point for me. So what we do is we connect the water to the cloud. Um, when we do that, we're able to generate results, and we're also able to educate um, the consumers of that application, and, and that is the goal. And so with that, um, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, the questions. Uh, Michelle? Michelle, are you there? Um, let me just see here. Sorry, I, I was just getting I was getting unmuted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can uh, I can ask for we've got one from Guillaume Dauphin. He mm -hmm. says, "Thanks for your talk. I think this is definitely what the attitude toward data should be. I'm currently working at DFO, and I'm very familiar with data storage issues, i.e., security issues, poor referencing, data only available on one machine, uh, because things have been." the way they are for so long it seems to become the norm and in order to make changes one needs to um, make some administrative requests to be authorized to change things. If one had the authorization then the issue is finding the time and resources to update all of the data sets and make them available to all. In the current economical situation and different budget cuts in government agencies do you see any hope to make things better? Mm, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the current economic, the current economic situation, well, I think we can look no further than our friends south of the border. Um, during their worst economic crisis in many years, they continued to push forward with this type of effort, and uh, we of course know that Obama has made big data um, his personal agenda, and uh, we know that meant many things for many different people. I'm sure. Uh, our guests have heard about the NSA by now, um, but uh, another major in initiative has been, of course, all the work that's been done by NOAA. And uh, I'm intimately familiar with what NOAA's been doing uh, in terms of collecting data across the United States. Um, they uh, manage a number of regional projects, and all of those data are collected and also put into a national cloud uh, data server. Um, they were able to do this during, uh, of course, a, a, you know, an economic downturn. And um, the, the beauty of uh, cloud-based technology is, of course, if you are in an economic pinch, um, you can, of course, ratchet down the resources necessary to continue to be sustainable um, because it's all virtualized hardware. Uh, unlike uh, in the past, where machines were running as physical hardware, um, you know, you needed a room of servers to, to run a cloud. Um, now you don't need that room of servers. You can have two or three 
uh, fairly expensive servers, but um, you can you can uh, control the amount of bandwidth, amount of power, um, all those types of things that are used for the service. If, if the economy is is uh, not supporting keeping everything up and running full speed. Another thing is, of course, uh, security access to data that you've mentioned. And this is a very important topic, and this is something that I think, uh, you know, will continue to keep coming up as we uh, start to accumulating these larger and larger data sets. Um, certainly, uh, foreign interests are very interested in uh, these types of data, and our politicians are concerned about those, uh, you know, those foreign bodies. And so some of the you know, publicly collected data isn't so public. It's actually not very publicly accessible. In fact, many people within their own organizations are not able to access those data. Um, I don't know uh, how that's going to change internally with these organizations. Um, it's been my experience with uh, environment ministries and environment Canada and VFO, for instance, that uh, um, these things move very slowly. So. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know. There is a, a glimmer of hope, though. With Environment Canada, they um, have mandated that uh, they're going to get out of the data hosting business, as uh, they told me, and uh, they're looking to uh, make some of uh, at least some of their um, major data sets publicly accessible. And they've been doing that actually. Um, um, for instance. Uh, all of their hydrographic data should be publicly available now. They're, they made their water quality data available. Um, not easy to find out there on the internet right now, but they have made these data sets available. And, and I think their hope is, is for private organizations such as, uh, well, I'll use the Weather Network as a good example. Um, the Weather Network has made a business on top of what uh, Environment Canada and their uh, meteorologists have been doing over the last 50 years. Um, you know, they consume Environment Canada's weather station data, and, uh, you know, they've made a multi-million dollar business out of it. Um, I think we can consider those types of opportunities, especially in the private sector, um, for publicly collected data, and encouraging government agencies to provide those data, I think, is, uh, is paramount. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, Guillaume says thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no um, okay, so from Elena Plummer, she says, can you provide a progress update on, on MB Waters? Uh, that, well, yes, so we would do these questions now. Um, any any uh, general questions about this, and then we'll, okay. we'll talk specifically about MB Waters. Okay, she's got one more, more general one. Can you speak to how well data standardization processes have been received by groups wishing to contribute to this type of network? How have you or would you address the challenge of incorporating data of differing quality? So I guess there's two big questions there. Okay. Um, well, uh, actually, this is kind of an NB Waters related question. And so the way we've handled this with NB Waters is, is we've been looking at uh, the ability for, you know, these, these lesser quality data sets to be part of our application. And so what we've done is we've identified uh, basically creating several different databases. And so these databases are based on um, 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 tiered access, if you will. And uh, the folks that have access to the Environment Canada database, um, you know, are not, not going to be the folks that are going to be putting data into the, uh, you know, the quote unquote lesser quality data sets. But um, our facility and services that we're building allow the user to be able to upload those data um, as an individual, um, as part of an agency. And if you're part of an agency, uh, the coordinator for the agency has control of whether the data is made publicly accessible um, or it's kept private amongst the agency. So we're not only just thinking about public accessibility of the data, but um, if the agency feels that the quality of the data is not, um, is not up to scratch, but they would still like to store it and, and keep it part of the database. This is something that the New Brunswick Aquatic Data Warehouse has been doing for years. Um, there's certainly many lesser quality data sets 
uh, um, within that collection, as well as data that's been collected by, uh, you know, these federal and provincial agencies. So, um, I, you know, I, I think it's still a great facility for anybody out there collecting data to be a part of. And Elena says thank you. Okay. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Before we switch over, um, you had in the presentation you uh, gave Microsoft Access um, Excel text files as being examples of poor data storage methods, yeah. and I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Are you talking about um, how the data should be entered before it's uploaded to the cloud, or um, I guess do you have any recommendations about what sorts of software data should be entered in if those are examples of poor? Um, um, the programs themselves are not the problem. It's actually the way the data is stored, the, the, the formatting of the data in those programs is the okay. problem. So basically most, most folks uh, like this, the spreadsheet uh, paradigm, right? People like to store data in their spreadsheets, uh, many, 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 many columns of data. And uh, this is a really big challenge for um, database administration and, and standardizing these types of data. That's one issue. Um, water quality data set, for instance, the USGS uh, water quality data set is stored uh, using the spreadsheet concept. And they have 228 columns of data in a single spreadsheet. Um, anybody that's analyzed data or has taken data and put it into a database um, following the, the, you know, the modern database administrative techniques, we'll know that's not how the data should be stored. And so this was a major challenge for us when we were working on the Threats Project, and, and we developed several data templates. And so those data templates will use the build uh, stored procedures that we then ran our um, uh, spreadsheets through those stored procedures, which would then produce the data in, in the proper format for database storing. And so you get rid of those 228 columns of data, and you have one column. And then you have another column which has an identifier. That the identifier is a unique ID number that represents the variable in which that data field um, contains. And so, for instance, if you had, let's say, uh, you know, dissolved oxygen, and its identifier was, you know, the number two. Um, you would have your value in one field, and then you would have that identifier of two representing dissolved oxygen. This makes it a lot easier for you to be able to also query the data, makes the system faster. Um, it's how the social networking uh, data also works. It's, uh, you know, form systems, whatnot. Um, you know, look at something like how WordPress, for instance, works. Um, the same nuts and bolts of those types of systems uh, is what's being applied here. So, um, just to follow up on that, so what would you suggest for someone, say, say working in a watershed group who wouldn't have access to um, a data engineer? Um, and I mean, one of the reasons, I, I, yes. That's a, that's a great question. And so what we're doing with MB Waters is we're actually going to provide the data templates um, that we've created and we've envisioned. These are what we're pushing. Um, we're pushing these data templates to become, a, you know, an open standard. Um, when we launch MB Waters, so this is a big part of uh, the project is is to uh, you know look at several different types of data that the watershed groups collect on a regular basis. You know, water quality is of course a big one. Biological health, uh, fish health, um, these types of data that uh, folks are collecting right now, and uh, we've got a lot of samples from you know we've got some lakes association, for instance, that just. Um, you know, did a talk for them back in December and, and presented with them some work on the Yoho Lake. Um, well basically, these templates um, are pretty, pretty ubiquitous across many different types of data, and we certainly have once we've figured out the format and uh, what what's the data that's necessary to keep. Um, we provide these templates, and if you follow the template and you upload the data to MB Waters, it can be entered into the uh, you know the official database um, and will be made uh, you know accessible you know as part of our reporting system. Now, if you don't want to do that, um, certainly you don't have to, and you can actually just upload it as a spreadsheet or an access file, um, and uh, you know indicate when you're uploading it that uh, you don't want it uploaded to the uh, the geo database. Great, thanks, Vince. Yeah. 
Okay, we've got another question here from Claire Herbert. Uh, she says, hi Vince, thank you for your presentation. It is good to know that there are other people slash agencies looking to promote a standardized data method. Your statement about the Environment Canada data was very interesting as we at the University of Manitoba recently obtained through an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, a data portal, Knowledge Network Hub, developed by EC. The hub was designed with, the many, concern, with many of the concerns in mind that you've already stated and as a way for the public researchers and managers to access any information related to the Lake Winnipeg Basin, which includes four provinces and four U.S. states. We are aiming to standardize the data storing using SQL data, warehousing architecture. We have based the metadata collection on FGDC and NAP standards. Have you utilized any of these standards in your templates? We would love to work with you more on this type of data management. Uh, yeah, we definitely have used the FGDC uh, uh, template, uh, standardized templating. Um, We've looked at a, a great deal of different templating uh, uh, methodologies. Um, with regards to the, 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 the hub that she had mentioned, the knowledge, uh, modern knowledge hub, is that the WE hub uh, that was developed in Alberta? Um, I if it was, an unfortunate piece Oops. of information about that hub was that it's been discontinued. Um, the black funding. <laughs> Sorry, she says no, it's the lwbi.cc.umanitoba.ca hub. Oh, okay, the Manitoba hub. Sorry, I yeah. thought you'd said the we I thought you'd said the uh, the water hub which um, is an application that I was familiar with. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so we have followed a number of different uh, standards. Um, one of the things though that we found was getting two far into the technical with the non-technical folks has always been a major challenge um, for me. Like most of the folks that have these data sitting in their on their workstations are, you know, ecologists, uh, you know, environment folks, um, you know, ecotoxicologists. Uh, you know, nine times out of ten, they uh, they they kind of glaze over when you start talking about putting the data into a particular format and doing queries on it and, you know, even just talking about pivot tables and Excel and stuff like that can sometimes be a, a daunting thing for people, which I, is understandable. It's not their, it's not their area of profession. Um, so what we've done is w we've, we've kind of dumbed down um, the level of standardization that the, you know, the FGDC brings to the table for water quality data. Um, the reason why is, of course, we want to make it as simple and as easy and efficient as possible for agencies to be able to get their data into the format that we need for, uh, for MB Waters. Okay, there's no more hands raised or questions right now. Claire says thanks. <laughs> cool. Okay, so uh, let's just see here if I can get my screen to share. Yeah, we see it. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so you can see uh, the web browser now. I don't have. I have two screens here, so I just need to make <laughs> sure you see the right screen. Yeah, we see the right. We we see the correct screen. Yeah. Okay, so this is NB Waters as it currently exists. Um, here we have the home page. And so the way we're building NB Waters is essentially uh, we're looking at two major, two major user groups. One of them is, of course, the researchers and, uh, uh, you know, project managers and, uh, you know, th those types of more official um, agencies that will be interested in using the application. But then we're also looking at... Um, the public as well. And so we're thinking, uh, you know, the public is going to be very interested in utilizing this particular service. Um, and so we've been looking at other uh, uh, applications out there, like the weather network, in, in terms of the types of things they do to entice the general public to get interested in uh, this type of uh, initiative. So um, right now uh, we have a map here on the home page. This is a very early development uh, 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 version of the uh, the website. 
Right now we're looking at a launch of Envy Waters sometime um, in the uh, early slash late spring. Um, April uh, is looking like the likelihood of the launch launch month. And so what we're looking at doing with MB Waters is, is getting users to use the website, um, not just uh, agencies and organizations, but also general users. And so here on the home page, we have the waterways. And you can see we have a parenthesis with a, a comment. So somebody's made a comment at this particular river. And if we go ahead and click that, um, it will go ahead and take us to the page, which contains all the information about that particular river, the individual was there, and, and there's the comment that he had made. Uh, <laughs> <he'd> <laughs> this guy presented us with a photo of an eel he had caught. Um, we're encouraging people to discuss, um, discuss the various uh, uh, rivers and water bodies in New Brunswick, um, post pictures, uh, you know, data even. Um, whatever they want um, with regards to that particular water body. So really encouraging people to, uh, to come out and uh, you know tell us a little bit about that particular water body that uh, they're currently uh, you know that they're currently uh, experiencing. So we want the general public to really really take advantage of this service and uh, I think people are going to really like it once we start marketing it to the general public. I can I can definitely see lots of photos getting posted here. We're really playing on the social networking aspect of things too, and when information comes into NB Waters like this, um, we also syndicate it and uh, it goes out to our social media feed. So it will go out to uh, to uh, Facebook and as well as Twitter, and we'll let people have some fun with that. Um, on the more serious side of NB Waters, um, for our maps right now. Um, we have uh, just over 50 uh, maps generated for the province of New Brunswick based on the data provided to us from the New Brunswick Environment, uh, Natural Resources, uh, the University. Also, uh, several private industries have provided data to us. For a simple search uh, and, and categorization of the data. Um, so we have a uh, you know, community aquatic data set we can see this if we click it. Uh, you can bring up the map. Here we have the data that's available for this particular uh, community. Um, we have aquatic site ID. If you click that, it actually will take you to all the data that was used to generate that data point. And you continue to kind of keep clicking through. And some of these data look like this. Some of them look like reports. I'll uh, show you one that has some uh, some reports. So hydrographic data. This is our hydrographic map. Um, so these are all the hydrographic stations uh, across uh, New Brunswick. So we click this one here in Minto. Um, the station number, we click the station number. This is some basic metadata about the station. We click that and here we have the mean annual level of water across uh, 1965 to 2008 for that particular station in Minto. Um, so that's another another example. Um, let's just see here. Uh, electrofishing might be an interesting one. So this is our electrofishing map that we created from data provided by the uh, Department of Natural Resources. Um, go ahead and click one here. Will take us to this electrofishing site. And so here we have all the data collected uh, from various fish that were. Uh, uh, collected. And so all of these data will actually be exportable, so you'll be able to export um, all the reporting type data that we uh, we give off of all of our maps um, into a spreadsheet. So you can take away and do with whatever you would like. Uh, let's see here. And we have water quality. Of course, we've got uh, some water quality uh, examples as well. So here's all of our water quality stations in the province of New Brunswick again. Um, this is data that goes to the Environment Canada database that I mentioned during the talk. Um, same sort of mechanism again. Um, let's go ahead and pick something like uh, dissolved oxygen. We analyze the data and then we get the dissolved oxygen. This is providing some mean annual dissolved oxygen. Um, and you can also go ahead and uh, export or print the, uh, the figure. Okay. 
Um, so those are the, some, some map examples. We've got lots of great maps that have been generated, and every day we make, uh, we're making more maps. Um, you'll also see there's a number of buttons on our uh, maps page. So we give you a, a web mapping service, um, a comma separated file, a shape file for uh, you, know, you can go ahead and click this and uh, it will go ahead and download the shape file and you can open that up in your arc map and use the service that way. A Google KML so you can use it with Google Earth, even an SVG file which is a, a vector graphic file, um, and a JSON uh, link. So with JSON you can actually go ahead and use this to consume the data in, in an application if you have a web application, for instance. So for our apps, we're also building a number of different uh, applications um, for NB Waters. Um, we're currently working on an, an Angler's application. Unfortunately, I can't show you guys this application today. Um, we're also working on a uh, community water quality uh, application. Um, all of these different applications are uh, very much so in active development right now. Um, we're really excited about being able to provide applications. Right now, these are all web-based, but they're being built using HTML5, and uh, we're planning on providing a mobile accessible version, so you'll be able to get it on your tablets and your uh, smartphones as well. We're also collaborating uh, right now with uh, an organization at the University of Maine, um, and we're looking at bringing in even more data um, uh, sales to the border, from uh, the University of Maine to be included as part of these applications, so we're quite excited by that. We're also working with uh, Environment Canada um, to uh, build a Gulf of Maine, uh, a Gulf, yeah, a Gulf of Maine application um, for the Bay of Fundy region, and uh, that application should be available um, when we launch in April as well. Um, in terms of publishing data, so in terms of publishing data, right now we have a fairly simple mechanism. Um, all you need to do is, in order to be able to use this uh, publishing application, is, is, is basically you need your, your data in that standard format. And so when you go ahead and you say, okay, I've got some water quality data that I need to upload, um, we say, okay, here's, where, here's the template. You can download the water quality uh, lakes template, and you can uh, look at that template, determine how the data should be. Uh, organized when you upload it. When you click uh, an existing upload, um, this is an example of a data set that was uploaded. Um, this is data from the Yoho Lakes Monitoring Program by the New Brunswick Lakes Association. Here you can see uh, we've got data from uh, the different uh, sites at that particular lake. Um, and here's the data presented in the readable format. We also let you be able to uh, do some we use some geospatial tools as well as printing the data and saving the data out. So you can save the data to your desktop and, and use data from, from uh, these particular stations. Um, the types of data that we're looking at collecting, that these are the types of categories right now. Um, this will be all updated when we launch. Um, more categories added. Some of these will change a little bit. Um, but just to kind of give you guys a breath of what, uh, what's going into MB Waters and how it's starting to shape up. I also talked uh, during the talk about Dropbox in terms of revisioning the data, and that's something that we're actually doing with MB Waters. In the MB Waters cloud, we actually are keeping revisions of the data. Um, so if you upload a data set, for instance, you want to go back and look at an older data set, you know, let's say your cat jumped on the keyboard or something and deleted a whole row of data and you didn't realize, you can go back and get that revision of data. Um, and uh, well, I, I think that's uh, that's about it for the uh, the data aspect of it. Some other things that we are doing as well is we're also um, <coughs> we're also providing uh, some API access to MB Waters. So we're hoping other developers will come in and, and want to take part uh, with that. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's a that's a pretty good overview of uh, where we are at with MB Waters. So I'd love to take questions about this. Okay, so if anyone has questions about MB Waters, we, you can type them in or raise your little hand. Um, I just want to interject, so Alan Curry had originally agreed to do this talk, and then um, a few weeks ago felt that Vince would uh, be able to talk about MB Waters and data management a bit better. And in the end, it turned out to be a fantastic idea because Alan wanted to be 
uh, an attendee on this webinar, but he's actually carrying a picket right now because the UNB professors are on strike. So, but just for those from away, it's about minus 26 here with the wind chill. We're not snowing in Fredericton right now, but St. John's getting a storm. But yeah, so he's uh, he's freezing outside carrying a sign. So he'll listen to this later in the recording. No, we don't have any questions yet. I guess you wowed everyone. I've been I'm excited to see the Emmy waters. I think it's exciting that it's uh, um, how far it's come from the aquatic data warehouse to this. It's uh, blasting its way into the 21st century, that's for sure. <laughs> well, the aquatic data warehouse, um, you know, that's a project that I actually, I had a small part in mm -hmm. of that project as well. And uh, the aquatic data warehouse was sort of, was, was sort of built under the premise that um, it's a warehouse, right? It's yeah. simply just a, a data warehouse. But one of the major challenges we had with the aquatic data warehouse, and I know a lot of the users of the aquatic data warehouse had these issues too, which was they usually felt that they were actually entering the data twice with the aquatic data warehouse because there was no facility for you to be able to upload a spreadsheet and call it a day. You you had to, you know, take your data that you had somewhere. It's usually you had it in the spreadsheet to start with. And then you had to re enter it by hand using web forms. And it was really so anybody's ever used the uh, Microsoft Access's uh, forms to enter data, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, it's a lot of clicking and, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, people that are entering data all day long generally like to enter data in the spreadsheet. It's really the fastest and most efficient thing to enter data into. Um, and so we, uh, we wanted to correct that with MB Waters. We wanted to make it as easy and as seamless as possible for people to be able to enter data and, and not as be as complex as uh, the aquatic data warehouse was. Okay, we've got a few questions here. Eva Walker um, asks when the website will launch and also will anyone be able to upload data? Yes, so the website will launch, um, we're looking at right now April as being the month uh, for the launch. Um, we're currently, like I said, we're working on uh, the Gulf of Maine application, and uh, that's going to be part of the launch. And there's also a number of things that we're uh, currently tweaking and changing with the existing platform before we launch. Um, was there was there another part of the question, Michelle? Um, and will anybody be able to upload the data? Y yes, that's a great question. So anybody will be able to upload data. Um, whether you're part of the, an agency or, or not, you'll be able to upload data. You'll be able to upload the data as an individual. You can make it private, so it can be just a place where you personally store um, data, or you can make it publicly accessible. And when you upload the data, uh, uh, basically it will create a map, and we'll give you a link, and you can share that link with uh, whoever you want. If you've made it public, it will be all publicly accessible. Excellent. Uh, Peter Cronin says, good presentation. Can you suggest a strategy to develop a process or plan whereby the majority of historical and current aquatic and fisheries data for all watersheds in New Brunswick eventually gets populated into MB Waters? Um, we're currently lo looking at that. Um, I couldn't give you a date as to when um, that will be, you know, that will be available. Uh, however, um, Certainly, having the data and having the data being uploaded when it launches will allow us to be able to build a, a specific application around that request. Um, the more data that we have, the, the easier it will be for us to be able to identify, um, you know, how to build the application around that particular data set. And we're also, you know, looking at the biological data. Um, you know, we'll continue to keep adapting the, uh, the, the data standards that we've been building um, for as new data comes in. So if your data doesn't fit in the standard and there's no way for you to make it fit into the standard, you're certainly still welcome to upload that data to NB Waters. It just won't go into our ge geo database until we have, uh, you know, the ability to take a look at it and see what challenges exist with that data set. And, Great. and we're definitely oh. willing to work with any uh, organizations that may have those types of challenges as well. Fantastic. We've got one more from Atlanta Plumber. Were any concerns raised about mapping locations of aquatic species at risk? 
Um, well, the existing aquatic data warehouse had um, had uh, done a number of uh, number of actually reports um, where they data was included as part of the Sarah project. Um, that continues to be a concern, and um, you know, there's certainly no reason why MB waters cannot be used um, to collect information on, on species at risk. We're also looking at that reminds me, you know, we're also looking at invasive species as well. So, um, you know, collecting that type of data is, is very important for the province. Okay, I think um, I'm gonna. There's no more questions that I see, so I think I'm gonna drop the drop the chop just because um, people have been with us for more than an hour now, so we'll let people get on with their day. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much, Vince. And um, before everyone goes, just a reminder that the next presentation in this series will be on February 12th, um, and it will be on the topic of water temperature in rivers, uh, delivered by Anik Daigle. She's from um, the INRS in Quebec and also Cégep Garneau. And this presentation will be delivered in French. The next English presentation will be on February 26th from Todd Dupuis from the Atlantic Salmon Federation. He will be speaking on fish passage and stream restoration techniques, case studies from PEI. Registration and listings of the webinars are available on the ASCF and the CRI website. So that's it for today. Thanks, everyone, for participating and hanging in there. And we hope you'll join us again very soon.